Hello. Um, I'm Dr. Julian Dunn. I'm the head of the uh, Dynamics Control and Vehicle Research Group here at the University of Sussex. And in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to be telling you something about our research activities. First, I'd like to uh, say something about the outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to begin by saying who we are in the Dynamics Control and Vehicle Research Group, say something about what we do and, and why, and then I'm going to go through a selection of current research. First thing is who we are. There are uh, nine current members in place in the research group, logistic members of the permanent staff. Um, my colleague, Professor Derek Atherton, is an emeritus professor of control engineering. Uh, Yevgeny Petrov is a reader in structural dynamics. Romeo Glovnia is a, a reader in tribology. William Wang is a lecturer in a senior lecturer in engineering, and Chang Wang is also a lecturer in engineering. Dick Atkins and Jean Pierre Pirot are permanent research fellows with huge experience in the automotive industry. And we are <coughs> appointing two other members of staff, one in low carbon vehicles and the other in power electronics. In addition, we have something like 18 researchers comprising postdoctoral research fellows, visiting research fellows, and about uh, 12 or more postgraduate research students. So in total, our complement is in the region of uh, just under 30. So what kind of research we do? Well, as you'd expect, we do work in dynamics, control, and vehicle research. But the focus of most of our work is on transport. In particular, the main drivers are concerned with reduction of carbon dioxide emissions and in the management and reduction of harmful emissions. And to give you some idea of the uh, projects we're involved with, I'm going to talk through each of these projects. The first five of these projects, and I'll explain each one as I go along, are concerned with ways in which we can modify conventional internal combustion engines to either improve their efficiency and therefore reduce emissions of carbon dioxide or to control them in a more effective way to reduce the harmful emissions. Five and six uh, are concerned with extending range of electric vehicles or conventional vehicles by either fitting some kind of range extending internal combustion engine or using a flywheel curs, namely a kinetic energy recovery system and the control of that is the particular focus. In tribology the emphasis is on reducing friction because tribology is the study of friction and if you reduce friction you reduce waste and therefore you reduce carbon emissions but also there are additional questions to do with the emissions of some of the harmful additives in lubricants. On structural dynamics, there's a, an array of applications both in uh, aerospace and in automotive. I'll say something about that. And then finally, another way of reducing emissions of vehicles is through light weighting, choosing lightweight structures of composites, of uh, additional types of advanced carbon structure. So I'll say something about that too. So starting with the first project, and that is a project that's been running for quite some years and has come to fruition and is nearing its completion, and that's on cylinder pressure re reconstruction for internal combustion engines. The focus on this project has really been to avoid the need to use very expensive in-cylinder pressure sensors which are also a problem in terms of durability. What we've been doing for quite some years is looking at different types of 
processing technique using information from existing sensors on the engine. In particular, a shaft encoder, which gives us information about the uh, kinematics of the crankshaft, but also using knock sensor information. And these are relatively inexpensive sensors. And what we've been able to do is design neural networks, train them, and being, being able to predict in real time the same information that comes from the use of these very expensive in-cylinder pressure sensors. Another project, and incidentally that previous project, was funded by the EPSRC and has had continuous involvement with Jaguar Land Rover. The second project, which is also funded by the EPSRC and has partners Ford, Ricardo and Denso, is looking at dispensing with the traditional method of cooling an engine using a liquid coolant and using evaporative, uh, an evaporative cooling system. The advantage of that is that you have much lower uh, mass of coolant and second, there's much less energy needed to actually drive the coolant around the system and thereby you generate lots of improvements in, efficient, in efficiency. The problem is one of control. If I show you the next slide, you can see uh, there's some examples of the kind of high temperatures that we're dealing with uh, from a, an internal combustion engine. The main problem is that the control required has to deal with an intrinsically unstable system and the vapour generation process, if it's not controlled adequately, will lead to overheating of the engine with catastrophic consequences. Another project that we're just starting is to create a zero NOx and in principle a zero carbon emission internal combustion engine using a closed cycle. Now in a normal co internal combustion engine you draw air from the atmosphere which is largely nitrogen and that's one of the sources of the oxides of nitrogen when you burn fuel. In this design the, the fluid in fact will be liquid oxygen rather than uh, nitrogen from the air and if we have uh, liquid oxygen entering the engine and we combust fuel it will generate obviously carbon emissions but if we cool these carbon emissions in fact the carbon dioxide and store it on the vehicle then we don't emit we don't emit any harmful emissions we don't in the terms of uh, oxides of nitrogen and we don't emit any carbon dioxide. That's the principle. Hopefully we should be able to create a, a closed system that practically allows you to carry the things that you need, in other words, the liquid oxygen and the um, liquid carbon dioxide um, without having to emit anything into the atmosphere. So it's essentially addressing NOx and um, carbon dioxide. We've also been doing some work for some years on looking at better control of diesel engines. This is a project uh, that has been supported by the European Union and essentially been looking at two things. One is using a form of smart control to reduce the emission of particulates and oxides of nitrogen using uh, essentially smart control of EGR, which is exhaust gas recirculation, and a VGT, which is a variable geometry turbocharger. And that we've tested in our uh, heavy duty test cell here at Sussex on a Caterpillar diesel engine. And the outcome of this has shown that, in fact, by smart control, you can indeed reduce the emission, particulate emissions and oxides of nitrogen. In the second project, we've been looking at, again for diesel engine, um, a split injection strategy. And we've been using um, a Ricardo Hydra engine, uh, research engine, to, to examine the potential of the split injection. What we found, in fact, is that split injection does indeed achieve significant reduction of oxides of nitrogen. Next slide shows the 
Caterpillar engine that's been used in the heavy duty cell. And the following slide will show the, the Ricardo uh, Hydra engine. So let's just go to the first there. We see the Caterpillar engine in our heavy duty test cell. And we can see the configuration. Essentially, it's the control of the uh, exhaust gas recirculation and the control of this variable geometry turbocharger that has accrued these benefits in terms of reductions of um, particulates and um, oxides of nitrogen. The second study, diesel study, involved the Ricardo Hydra research engine. And as I said, the split cycle uh, strategy has proven to be of, of great benefit. So both of these ideas have been tested on, um, in the lab on experimental data, verified experimentally. Moving on then to um, the range extender research we're doing, the BMW i3 engine, uh, a vehicle, which is um, the first volume produced extended range electric vehicle, which is in fact selling very well since its launch in 2013. Over 22,000 of these vehicles have been sold, which is quite remarkable. It can be an all-electric vehicle, although most people are buying the extended range option with the uh, range extender, which for that particular vehicle is a two-cylinder gasoline engine, delivers about 25 kilowatts, and it extends the range of the vehicle by around 70 miles beyond the all-electric operation. That's a conventional internal combustion engine. And this concept is one that's seen as being of great benefit in the future for the transition from hybrid to all-electric. And we have here at Sussex some intellectual property on a concept that could fully meet the requirements of a, a third generation range extender. And this is the concept. It's a rotary engine. It's internal combustion, yes. It has a number of benefits, including potentially very high power weight ratio and high efficiency. But it can also, when it's not being used, operate as a kinetic energy recovery system because all the essential ingredients are in place. So the main difference between this and a conventional internal combustion engine is this relies on controlled resonance for its operation. Now you can actually generate a linear version of this concept and I have in fact had a group of fourth year MEng project students last year who built a linear version to try and realize the resonance that's so important to the operating concept. They did that in 2014. They built a linear version, which you can just see on the right. So it doesn't involve any rotary motion, and it's somewhat simpler to build. But they did such a good job of it that they entered for a STEM award which is sponsored by the Daily Telegraph and they entered the automotive category which is sponsored by McLaren and they won. And here we see three of the team, there were a team of six last year, three of the team at the awards ceremony in London receiving their STEM award, something we're extremely proud of. The story continues but that was a great milestone in the development of the linear version. I've mentioned kinetic energy recovery systems before. Well, the next slide is essentially about control of kinetic energy recovery, which is an important step in the extension of uh, electric vehicle, extending the range of electric vehicles. This next slide shows um, this is a production KERS, Kinetic Energy Recovery System, developed by uh, Flybrid, and it's extensively, or was, that particular version was extensive, extensively used 
in Formula One, but the problem with curves is to control it in such a way that you meet a number of objectives, one of which could be to minimize the energy losses during the transfer of the energy, because energy losses mean generation of heat and you end up with quite a significant thermal management problem. We've done quite a bit of work on optimally controlling the gear ratio because almost all curves, mechanical curves with flywheel, involve the need for a continuously variable transmission of some form. There are many different designs, but the popular one used in Formula One is actually a mechanical CVT. We've developed an optimal control strategy to examine that, and the benefits of that can be realized quite easily in the, with the next slide where we compare an optimal strategy in terms of the energy lost during a complete cycle of transfer of energy from the vehicle to the flywheel. The solid line shows in fact the energy lost using essentially a constant acceleration strategy. Whereas if you switch to the optimal strategy, you can see that we get something like a seven-fold reduction in the energy lost per cycle, which actually translate in, translates into something like one-seventh of the, the energy dissipated in heat that has to be thermally managed. So it's a great advantage. We can also address a number of other things, in particular to do with the reduction of the effort we need to implement the strategy and that can have impor an important bearing on things like durability of the curves which I think traditionally has been a problem particularly in Formula One. They are prone to failure quite considerably during operation for a whole variety of reasons. So moving on to tribology, my colleague Dr. Romeo Glovner is a tribologist and tribology at Sussex is focusing again largely on transport and in particular addressing questions to do with the lubrication of machine elements, uh, addressing important questions to do with measurement because experimental measurement is extremely important and difficult. Romeo is also interested in, in CVT, continuously variable uh, transmission design, and some of the issues to do with the more fundamental modeling in the mechanics. And the kind of uh, facilities we have at Sussex are indeed important. The experimental facilities are um, particularly concerned with optical measurement of um, transient lubrication and a whole variety of issues to do with things like measurement of viscosity down to extremely low levels. On the area of structural dynamics, particularly to do with uh, very complex machine interfaces, there are two particular application areas where this is finding um, quite a lot of use. The first one is on um, aero engines, gas, these are gas turbine engines, and this is a, a high bypass, um, uh, you can see a high bypass engine with a, a fan at the front and uh, a, a jet engine. Most of the thrust in this engine comes from this fan. And one of the problems is actually the problems associated with rotor stator contact and that can lead to all kinds of instability problems. The main difficulty in terms of the dynamics is that they're very nonlinear and the method of analysis is problematic as we'll see that the models tend to be very large. The other application area which is in the automotive sphere is in fact to do with brake squeal. Now the main problem with brake squeal, apart from wear of, of brake discs, is the emissions of very unpleasant noise. And this is still a problem and it's not yet fully understood. The main difficulty again is that the mechanics of the problem is highly nonlinear 
And the second thing is that the models that are needed tend to be very large. Just to illustrate then some of the aspects of the modelling, I mean the problem I mentioned of rotor stator contact is particularly uh, important for operating aircraft. It's possible to get an unstable type of motion and when this occurs it can be so detrimental to the operation of the aircraft that the flight crew are, are unable to even read the instruments. So it gives you some idea of the, the, the extent of the level of vibration on the aircraft and it has to go then into the so-called windmilling condition. It's, it's something that doesn't happen fortunately very often but it can occur and what we need to do is have an understanding of it before it occurs. There are many other problems that are concerned with issues of contact which generally um, are associated with dampers that are fitted on uh, turbine rotors using a variety of techniques including stubbers and the main difficulty with the modeling as you can see from the lower slide is that a model with so-called degrees of freedom tends to be rather large and it's not untypical to have models with over a million degrees of freedom which for a nonlinear system is actually a major problem and this is the kind of work that Yevgeny is making quite a lot of progress on and he has done for some years with some very well-known people in the field. I mentioned that our focus is on carbon reduction in transport particularly in automotive. Well one area that that can be achieved in is through the process of light weighting. In other words selecting either novel materials or novel forms of structure in which to design a vehicle. My colleague Chang Wang is actually working on a number of problems which are concerned with light weighting and the first one I'm just talking about here is on the use of cellular components achieved through the manufacturing process known as laser sintering. Now this is a process which can create some very novel structures which have some extremely attractive properties. One of the difficulties though is actually how do you get an understanding of the, the mechanics of such a structure and Chang is a finite element expert who's focused on being able to create such models to get that level of understanding. And here we see a cellular component under test. Another type of uh, structure which has attractive properties is to introduce dimples into steel structures. You can see here an example of a, a structure with dimples and again the modeling aspect is far from trivial and here we see an example of a, a dimple structure being loaded and the hope is that you accrue a number of benefits from dimpling in other words you can achieve a, a much greater um, res resilience to high loads and it's much lighter so it's ideal for construction of vehicle bodies in particular automotive vehicle bodies and parts of the, the automotive vehicle. This uh, particular slide shows um, the use of semi-rigid connections to maximize uh, the load bearing of a structure and here is an example of um, a bolt hole under test. One of the big problems with structures is, is usually you end up with some, some kind of stress concentrations at uh, a point of high loading and in addition to the, the design of the structure we also need to have a better understanding of the mechanics and that's, uh, that's what Chang is focusing on. An additional requirement though of structures which are, are adopt either clever designs or composite materials is an understanding of their noise, vibration and harshness characteristics. 
And here, um, this slide shows some of the work that's going on on the simulation of the acoustic responses, which is another emission from the vehicle. It's one that's important when the vehicle is at speed, and much of that noise, certainly in conventional vehicles, emanates from the structure. And here you can see the kind of modeling that's going on um, to handle acoustic uh, sound pressure levels. We have at Sussex a um, formula student team, and I think it's well worth mentioning that team. They are um, entering in 2015. There are 24 students involved, and they get support from our senior research fellows who have spent most of their working life involved either in the automotive industry as a whole or involved in some specialist area like Formula One engine development. And here you can see the, the team uh, pr preparing the vehicle and they will race in 2015 at Silverstone and who knows, maybe they will uh, win. We also uh, have some outside contacts that are worthy of note. In 2014, in October 2014, uh, I accompanied a small delegation um, from the UK to India to explore a number of things, one of which is the possi possibility of a better research collaboration. And this was led by um, our Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills, Dr Vince Cable. And there you can see the entire group. And we had a very busy four days visiting research establishments in India and production facilities. Most uh, informative and, and most useful. Well, that's all I want to talk about. And if for any reason you have any questions, then don't be afraid to put those questions to me. Send them by email or otherwise. Thank you. Thank you very much.